The spirit of Detroit. It looks like you lost another one. Welcome one, welcome all. This is Spirit of Detroit Podcast. Like, comment, subscribe for more thought-provoking content like this. Click the bell icon button. James Houston the fourth. Or fifth. James Houston out of Jackson State is probably one of my favorite prospects that the Lions drafted. One, because I covered HBCUs heavily. I'm not just a person who popped up HBUC footage and I'm just saying this I've been covering them for the last two years I've been covering prospects coming out of HBCUs for the last two years I've watched the HBCU Combine the Legacy Bowl I've watched uh, those HBCU players uh, also get invited to the Shrine game or the NFL PA game and I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that we drafted a player from a HBCU. Uh, one of the reasons is because we didn't we didn't have a presence at the HBCU combine, nor did we have a presence, uh, a significant presence. I mean, we didn't send ten scouts. We didn't send. We sent probably one guy, and that one guy checked out mentally for me. But uh, I was pleasantly surprised that James Houston was drafted. Now, first and foremost, I'm going to say that James Houston was the second best pass rusher in the HBCU class. That's the first thing I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say is he was not always a pass rusher. When he went to Florida, he was actually a run-stop, run-gap defender. He only unlocked the pass rushing ability when he met Deion Sanders at Jackson State University. And me being a Jackson State fan, I should know this. I can't just get on the YouTube and start talking crazy about prospects I don't know. I literally know James Houston. In fact, I wanted to do videos about him. And around the time I wanted to do videos about him, we ran a 3-4. Then we ran a 4-3. And he just got lost in the shuffle. Some of his highlights are still on my phone, still on my uh, laptop. You know, I love James Houston. But the thing I love most about him is he reminds me of Cliff Averill. And I think that's a bad comparison, but hey, he, as a pass rusher, is a Cliff Averill. He's a explosive first step, smaller defender that can use his agility to beat the right tackle or the left tackle. To me, he is a wide nine defensive end. He can play the wide nine. He, To me, he was a better fit for the Eagles, but now that we're using him, and we can use him in a variety of ways, in a plethora of ways, I appreciate the Detroit Lions even more now. Now, whoever was responsible for, caveat here, Whoever was responsible for not putting up his Jackson State highlights in Detroit for Detroit, shame on you. Tim from accounting or whatever, Tim from the IT department, videography department, you should be ashamed, Tim. You should be ashamed. But let's get into the reasons why we drafted James Houston. James Houston is going to scare a left tackle, right tackle that has less athletic ability. I think he's going to scare an individual when it comes to the pass rush that has less athletic ability. What I mean by that is when you're scared of a person's explosion like like you see up here, you're second guessing their movements. They can undercut you they can blow right past you so it makes them more unpredictable and you more predictable a lot of 
left tackle, right tackles are cumbersome. They're not athletic freaks. That's why we love Pene Suel because he has good feet. He's a great athlete. Getting around Suel is hard to do. Getting around Michael Orr was hard to do because he had great feet. But when you don't have great feet, when you are susceptible to getting ripped, run, and undercut, and when he's with the block, he's going to be on the outside shoulder, right here, outside shoulder to helmet. When you pass that helmet on your outside shoulder, it's over with. This is Cliff Averill all day. This is what Cliff Averill used to do. He used to duck, dive, and, 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 and just dip and rip his way to the quarterback. Again, look, I'm not engaged. We're not engaged. I'm going to dip. I'm going to rip. I'm going to flip my hips. Hold on. So good I got to do it again. Dip, rip, flip my hips, and go. <laughs> and one thing I really like about James Houston is he knifes through. When he's playing off the ball as a linebacker, he can sift through trash. And when I say sift through trash, is that left guard, that left tackle, that center that's trying to get to second level and block him as a linebacker, he can shed those blocks very quickly. He doesn't even engage some of the time. He knifes through, just like this play here. At the end of the day, when you look at a player like this, this usually warrants, oh, a third round pick type of grade. But when we talk about level of competition and all these other things coming to play, you know, that's why it was taken in the sixth round. Now, my familiarity with James Houston is real, real clear. But my lack of understanding with the level of competition is very unclear. There was no level of competition when we were talking about Chad Muma. There was no level of competition when we were talking about Chanel. There was no level of competition when we were talking about individuals like Anderson. We never brought that up. When we brought up Troy Anderson, we talked about the athlete, and that was it. We didn't talk about he played Division II football, Montana State. So that shouldn't be brought up with this prospect at all. Those tangible skills are all translatable. The tangible skill to block shit, to disengage blocks very fast, to... You see it in the graphic. Those skills are already instilled in him to engage, disengage, get to the ball carrier. Looking at tape that's available, that's out there, that's clear to see for everybody in my database, um, him at Florida, he was not a good player two, three years ago. You know, he, he didn't take the shortest path to the ball he he did some of the core things by trying to dodge tacklers or trying to dodge blockers some of the time but it was it was no near nowhere near the level of what he did at jackson state and what he did in the nfl pa game and i'm willing to go as far as to say that they basically made him as a linebacker inside linebacker they made him think they made him think too much and not feel the game not play the game or they just didn't coach him properly. Because when you look at his film in 2020, and, and you could say talent and level of talent, let me explain something to you. I feel as though the coaches at Jackson State are like the coaches at the Detroit Lions. They're about player development. A lot of coaches in the SEC, they want a chip. If you can't ball right now, and this Florida team was horrible anyway. If you can't ball, <laughs> it's a wrap. So he balled, he played out, he played out his existing, I guess, NCAA rules. He was a senior, he went as a graduate transfer to Jackson State, and it worked out for him because those coaches actually nurtured him and showed him how to get through the blocks and showed him how to be a finesse kind of pass rusher and unlocked a part of his game that I think was kind of dormant. I think when you look at the film that's on him, and I'll do more of the film study if y'all would like, but if you look at the film on him from two years ago with Florida, 
They were basically trying to make him a Jared Davis. Take on the block, don't disengage. Just just run <laughs> just run head first into a blocker and beat him up and it was just bad. It was just bad. So the film that's out there for Jackson State is kind of grainy. It's not great quality. Um, not because of the school, just because whoever took the whoever used the camera is terrible camera. Some of these stadiums have cameras where you need to have them, and some stadiums have people using scout tape and their own cameras. So the Jackson State tape isn't good, but the tape that I have explained and I have seen um, has been virtually studied. You know, has been studied. And me being at Fort Bliss has yeah, cut into my studying. Me being on an Army mission has cut into my studying of this prospect. But I'm so familiar with him that I know him like the back of my glove. Now, my only concern with him is probably going up against tight ends and being a six-foot uh, quarter-inch player. That's the only problem I see because some of these tight ends, your Travis Kelsey's, your um, your Hawkinson's, they're 6'5", 6'3", and he may feel comfortable in zone, but on one-on-one -on -one coverage is what I'm really concerned about. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the film that's out there on him when it comes to tight ends, he can drop back. He, he can drop back with the best of them. He can try to get man to man with them. He has a lot to work with in that regard, as opposed to that being, oh yeah, you're short, you can't cover. He can cover a little bit, but his deficiency is being short, if that makes sense. This is Spirit of Detroit Podcast. Like, comment, subscribe for more thought-provoking content like this. I'm sorry, this ain't the deepest dive because due to tape and time and all these other things. But if you want me to do another video, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know in the comments how did you like this one. I'm going Aiden Hutchinson. Um, next deep dive. I'm making time for it. I go to sick call, whatever I got to do, Army-wise. Aiden Hutchinson up next. So love y'all. Like, comment, subscribe.